So just take a minute and gather your attention into your room, into your body, gently disengaging from everything that came before or will come after. And then setting your motivation, thinking when those who want enlightenment must give even their own body, there's no need to mention external things. Therefore, without hope for return or any fruition, give generously. This is the practice of bodhisattvas. So just take a minute and remind yourself of what you love about generosity, what you remember about generosity. And then thinking, without ethics, you can't accomplish your own well-being. So wanting to accomplish others is laughable. Therefore, without worldly aspirations, safeguard your ethical discipline. This is the practice of bodhisattvas. So just connect with those two the intention to give, the intention to restrain from harm. Both imbued with bodhicitta. So um, today we're going to start with these two verses on generosity and ethics, and then we're going to move on to Chandrakirti's sevenfold reasoning, looking at the object of negation. So um, if you have this book handy, either electronically or physically, um, first we're going to start with the verses. So if you want to look um, on the ba bottom of page four of your main semester text, verse 25. This is where we um, start the precepts for training in the practices, training in the six transcendent perfections or the six paramitas. Um, this is where we're officially getting into the perfections, even though we've been talking about them all semester. Um, here in the text is where they're officially coming into being. So starting with generosity, um, you all have gone over generosity at some length. And um, I'm guessing this idea of the intention to give and it taking these, you know, four different forms is something that um, is beautiful and nourishing to you. You maybe connect with some more than others. But when you think about the perfection of generosity, what are the highlights? What are those main points that you really um, remember as important or inspiring about generosity? What do you remember about generosity? Or in particular, the perfection of generosity? I, I do remember that uh, there is a different kind of generosity, like generosity of giving generosity of uh, like teaching the giving things and teaching the, the Dhamma and uh, 
another kind of generosity which I really forget. Yep. <laughs> yep, exactly. Are there uh, other ones that others remember? Yeah, Anta. Giving security or uh, freedom emotional security. security. Yeah. Yeah. That's a huge one. That's like your work, isn't it? Offering freedom from fear or offering security. That's your kind of most regular form of generosity, I think, that you guys are doing. Yeah, that one's really important. Um, do you remember the other one? Offering a Dharma? Yeah, yeah, offering Dharma is one. Um, or timely advice when asked <laughs> is how you hear that. Timely advice when asked or when there is an opening. Um, but yeah, there, there, there's one more. There's one more. It's all right if you don't remember, but if it pops into anyone's mind. Giving the body. Giving the body is, um, in a way, could be considered giving, just giving, giving, giving material aid. Um, the, 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 the other one that um, doesn't seem to naturally fall into this category, but we talk about a lot, is loving kindness. So to say that love is a form of generosity is kind of interesting. It's kind of an intriguing idea. You know, of all the places where we could categorize love, the wish for others to have happiness, why does it go in generosity, the intention to give? You know, there's an interesting relationship between those two concepts um, that we could explore maybe experientially. <clears throat> Do you see a natural relationship between love and generosity if we define generosity as the intention to give? Look, it's, it's something interesting to explore. Um, we're remembering that when we look at the perfection of generosity, they kind of talk about it in four levels of significance or importance. Um, you know, the, the best form of generosity being offering dharma um, or timely advice when asked. Why is that the most important? Because that's going to lead to the greatest benefit. You know, the greatest benefit is going to come from people learning about their own mind and how to cultivate happiness and diminish suffering. I mean, that's the most powerful thing you can offer someone is tools. So, you know, that's the highest form of generosity. And then we have loving kindness and freedom from fear. And freedom from fear, this offering, I mean, this is just unbelievably powerful. You're basically saying to someone that you are safe with me. Sounds so simple, but you know, safe from what, right? Safe from judgment, safe from, I don't know, any number of things. Physical safety is obvious, but there's all these other kinds of safety that I think all of you actively cultivate in your practice that are actually very rare things to find in society. If you're to have a normal conversation with just regular person, are you both offering each other freedom from fear? Or is there an edge of competitiveness or an edge of domination and submission? Is there an edge of something besides communicating the content? You know, how often are we actually offering freedom from fear in a normal conversation? So I think it's quite remarkable that you're offering this kind of safety, this kind of um, absolute acceptance just as something naturally that you do during your work. And so if you can, uh, you know, consciously think of how do I pull that same ideal into the very ordinary experiences in an ordinary day with people that I'm not in charge of looking after or been asked to look after, you know, the people who might even have power over me or the people that I am in a peer relationship with, how do I spread that more evenly? Because it is one of the most powerful forms of generosity, creating safety. So there's that one. And then offering loving kindness is obvious, offering the wish for others to have happiness without an agenda, right? Without them needing to then become happy as a result of our work, without them needing to appreciate it, without needing any kind of uh, reciprocal relationship, um, you know, pure love as an offering is, is quite profound. So we've talked about that a lot, but um, just to kind of plant that in the list. 
And then the last one is offering material things. So, you know, to offer material things right now, I think is more interesting because um, some of our deprivation mentality has been triggered and that maybe a tendency to hoard and cling to even our time, maybe not even our physical resources, but just kind of a protectiveness about our time and about our mental energy and about our space. We could get a little bit miserly about our space if it feels like people are intruding. Yeah, and so um, this type of generosity, I think, is, is very significant and powerful, even though it's out on the bottom of the list. Um, so any, any just kind of follow-up thoughts? I know you guys did a whole section of the semester, last semester, on generosity, and then um, we've done it in retreat as well. But um, just kind of any, any points of inspiration or questioning when we go back over this concept? When you look at the verse, those who want enlightenment must give up even their own body. There's no need to mention external things. Are you feeling comfortable with that? <laughs> as a gradual process that we work up to, not as something you need to magically be able to do immediately. Yeah. Um. It's like, like it, as a target, it is very, very difficult to look at it. But as a state that you imagine it, it do, does find blissful. Yeah, that's good, <laughs> that's good. I think that even in ordinary day and in um, small things, when we give, we feel happy. We, we, are, we have joy. Yeah, exactly. It's a point we see repeated everywhere, right? That when you're living for the other, you are well. When you're living for yourself, you're unhappy. And self-cherishing always tells us the opposite, always has told us the opposite. It's been lying to us forever. And yet it's hard for us to break the spell of it because of course we do need to look after ourselves in a human needs sort of way. It's about the mentality of being oriented and locked down into me first blocks all of our happiness. And when we're expanding out into giving, we're naturally more joyful. But to break the spell of self-cherishing is really difficult because it tells us the opposite and it says it's protecting us. Yeah. I think yeah. pregnancy is the, a good example of giving your body. That's what I have in mind. We can extend this because this is the most the pure and yeah, and literal, <laughs> literally giving your body. Yeah, well, I'll just take a minute and think, thanks, mom. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. And even just um, giving of time, giving of energy, you know, giving time and energy, it, it has um, a physical toll on us at our level, but it has less of a physical toll on us depending on how expansive our heart is about it, doesn't it? And, uh, you know, I think similarly with, you know, literal giving of body, I'm sure that there's days when it's more fatiguing than others. And why is that? And what are the ingredients for that is an interesting place to explore. So, you know, generosity is so simple. It's so easy to understand and, and it is really hard to practice. But if we remember that um, if there's advice given to lay people who don't study, right? Um, lay people who don't study, you guys do study, but lay people who don't study, the advice of how to create a positive future, positive future in this life, positive future in fu positive life in your future lives, generosity and ethics, right? That's the main practice of non-scholarly Buddhists. <laughs> generosity, ethics, generosity, ethics, those two. And with those two, you can achieve another perfect human rebirth even if you never meditate. Yeah, even if you never meditate, even if you nev never understand emptiness, um, even if you're, you know, very ordinary life, generosity, ethics, 
perfect human rebirth. And those are the main causes, right? The main cause for a perfect human rebirth is ethics. And to have resources within that human life, you need to have practiced generosity to create the cause for resources. So, so just kind of having that in the back of your mind of, okay, we're talking about all these higher things. We're talking about bodhicitta. We're talking about emptiness. But in terms of our daily life, are we ethical? Are we generous? What we actually get up to, you know, what our actual activities are. Of course, as we study, we're going to weave our study into our daily life and we're going to weave our study into our practice. But just in terms of who you are now as a person living in society, are those two things, simple as they are, things that we're oriented around? You know, think about the opposite of generosity, um, you know, stealing or taking what hasn't been freely offered. Do we take for granted resources communally owned, for example? Or do we um, use things that don't really belong to us and do a little bit belong to other, you know? Picking the neighbor's oranges might not be that big a deal, but if they don't want you to, <laughs> it is creating an unfortunate pattern in your mental continuum. You know, downloading things from the internet that are not freely offered might not cause any obvious direct damage, but is it depriving the source of that material of a kind of livelihood? It's not been freely offered. So we might be a generally nice kind of person, but do we have these little inner excuses that we allow ourselves to not be fully full of our integrity. And to remember that one of our biggest obstacles in meditation is related to lack of ethics. We don't think of it that way, but there's a direct relationship between our ability to concentrate and how strong our ethics are, because ethics is about restraining from harm, restraining from non-virtue, when you have harmfulness and non-virtue as things happening in your life, your mind is agitated in either seeking them, wanting them, trying to bring them in, or justifying yourself having done them. Yeah, so you're either sitting in meditation and you're distracted towards what? Things you want to entertain yourself, things you want to grab and cling to and bring in and stimulate yourself with or justify all the mistakes you've made. You know, those are a lot of the distractions in a meditative session. If you're living ethically, you meditate easier and you sleep better. It's just a fact that we can use our own experience to prove. So it's interesting. Um, these two are so simple, but do we do them? So I think, you know, then the next one about ethics. Without ethics, you can't accomplish your own well-being. Right? Without ethics, you're not creating the cause for a perfect human rebirth. If you're talking about future lives, that's one thing. But even within this life, I think that you start to have an, an aura of untrustworthiness. You know, when you kind of go against ethics and in the back of your mind, you know, you're continuously doing the wrong thing. Never mind having made mistakes, stopping them, worked on it, etc. But when you're actively engaged in something non-virtuous, it, it does create something that disturbs your daily life's peace and makes you less safe to be with for others. Whether it's communicated, whether you're ever found out, I think it does do something in your kind of mental atmosphere internally and externally. So accomplishing your own well-being is harder, and of course, even more so the welfare of others, because you're distracted by that. Um, do you agree, disagree, add? I think literature and art in general uh, show many opposite examples, but you know, I get what you mean. Yeah, yeah, I mean, literature and art aren't good or bad in and of themselves, right? Yeah. If they're egocentric, not so good. If they're about sharing and connecting, two thumbs up, right? <laughs> the same art, the same whatever. Yeah. No, I mean, regarding the, 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 the assumption that, that when, once we're not ethical, then we are disturbed. Well, some people are, some people are not. So sometimes it's splitted or disavowed in, in ways that are very complicated. Yeah, it's a good point, but to be disturbed doesn't necessarily mean that you know that you're disturbed. 
Yeah, disturbance can be a halfway enjoyable experience, like in the case of excitement. So to say that lack of ethics disturbs your mind, it does disturb your mind even if you are also half enjoying it. You know, right? So it's not, it doesn't have to be something you would call disturbing, but there is an agitation that is clouding your clarity. There's an agitation that's preventing a level of focus, um, which is different to when you're in an ethical modality. It's less agitated. So even if it's a pleasurable, you know, quote, pleasurable agitation, it's still an agitation. Uh, the Hebrew translation uh, suggesting instead of the word uh, without ethics, it's written here without discipline. Is it uh, somehow a mistake or a mistake in translation or is it uh, resonate something that is uh, within, embedded within ethics? Yeah, it could be a synonym. Sometimes it's translated, um, sultrim is the Tibetan word, sultrim, um, can be translated as ethical discipline. Mm. Yeah, or ethics or discipline, sometimes translated as morality, which has a bit of a religious connotation, and so modern translators don't use morality as often. Um, restraint occasionally is used, but yeah, ethical discipline, both words together are actually quite common nowadays to hear. So then is there an added connotation if we think discipline that you're thinking of? Well, in the spiritual uh, uh, connotation, it's all right, because when I'm disciplined, I'm a disciple. I'm a disciple of the Dharma, of the Buddha, of the Sangha. I'm, I'm taking refuge in this uh, through three Jews. But in Hebrew, uh, discipline, the connotation is quite uh, different. But I think that we have to, to really, it's, somehow it uh, resonates for me, uh, the perfection of uh, joyous effort. In somehow, the effort is uh, being committed to the effort. Yeah, there's a, because um, sometimes joyous effort is translated as enthusiastic perseverance. So perseverance and discipline have some sort of relationship like you're describing. Yeah. yeah, perseverance. I mean, discipline in this context, we're also talking about a kind of willpower and steadiness of mind that is able to continue whether or not your senses are entertained, mm -hmm. you know? So sometimes practice is going to be interesting, enjoyable, stimulating, inspiring. Some days it's gonna be quite ordinary and maybe even boring and, you know, doesn't seem worth the effort. And discipline is saying, I have enough willpower to continue through the ordinary. I don't need peak moments to keep me coming back because I know that it takes a lot of ordinary to shift into something more extraordinary, you know? And so that kind of willpower, um, it, it's not something you wanna force, but it is a discipline of deciding to come back even when your surface senses don't feel like it. Yeah, coming back to restraining from harm, even when it's easier to do what is harmful, you know, even when it's easier to be not ethical, even when it's easier because no one will notice or ever know, what does it do to your inner work to let yourself off the hook from integrity? You know, so I think, you know, these kind of like inner battles with our integrity um, can really eat a lot of mental energy and make progress a lot more delayed. But, um, you know, it's something very personal too, isn't it, to ask, all right, so the Buddhist idea of integrity is living by the 10 virtues, refraining from the 10 non-virtues. That's the Buddhist idea of having integrity, is trying to live with those, have those, cultivate those. And when we fall off track, to acknowledge it with self-honesty, not self-punishment, not judgment, but just, I know I'm not to do that because that is harmful and that is not my path. And I'm doing it anyway because my senses want to. I'm doing it anyway because self-cherishing has taken over. To do the wrong thing while knowing it takes a very strong mind, it takes a much stronger mind than to disassociate. You know, say, you know, I'm not even gonna look at the fact that I'm doing that and that's not in alignment with my integrity. Yeah, so it's actually a huge step 
to even acknowledge where you're not in alignment with your ethics. It's a powerful step and they say that it's the essential ingredient to purification is to see a fault to be a fault. Yeah, as opposed to guilt, which is sort of like, if I feel bad about it, then I can keep doing it. That's the price I pay to do the wrong thing is to whip myself and then I don't have to change. Right, guilt, no guilt, bad, right? Regret, good, right, simple. Look, there are simple ideas and, um, you know, where we go to that, go with these is kind of up to you, but I, I think that we've, we've talked about them a lot. So, so if you have kind of interesting new connections that have come up or ideas, um, I'm happy to go into it, but otherwise we can shift to Chandra Kurdi. Do you have any added thoughts about those two, generosity and ethics? To be a perfection, they need bodhicitta. We are remembering that. Tick. Okay. <laughs> Done. Okay, um, so we're gonna go into Chandakirti a little bit. Um, don't be scared, okay? <laughs> so turn to page nine, chapter two, the object of negation. I'm not gonna read big whole long chunks of this, don't worry. All right, I'm just gonna kind of zoom in on a few of the key points and then we're gonna talk about it. Um, a lot of this chapter is synonyms and charts. If you like them, that's great. If they don't make sense to you, don't worry about it. Okay, some people really work well with charts and some people don't. So we're not gonna go into that whole section. Um, but I think just to kind of start with this first section, page nine, chapter two, where it says, Chandrakirti introduces his presentation of the sevenfold reasoning with the following verse. So the sevenfold reasoning is very similar to what we do with the fourfold analysis, recognizing the object of negation, looking how the self would exist if it were inherently existent. And then it goes on into more details about how to kind of negate that and unpack that. So, so I'll make you a meditation on the sevenfold reasoning, but just to kind of remember, it's not totally new content. It's very similar to the fourfold analysis. Okay, it's just a more elaborated form. So Chandrakirti says, a yogi sees in his mind that the afflictions and the faults arise from the false view of a transitory collection. Having understood that the object of this is self, he negates self. Okay, so this is the main thing to keep coming back to. And so we're gonna you know, peel it apart and sort of examine it a little bit. But to say arise from the false view of a transitory collection, remember the false view of a transitory collection is the self grasping that is the root of samsara viewing the self in your own mental continuum, holding it to exist inherently. Also called the reifying view of the perishing aggregates, <laughs> also called the misapprehension of self, many translations, but don't think something new is being discussed here. This is the same old problem troublemaker that we've been talking about the whole time. Okay, so the false view of the transitory collection. To say transitory is to help you understand that the aggregates are impermanent transitory and permanent, changing moment to moment, the false view of them. So you're looking at them and thinking about them the wrong way. Quite straightforward, yeah? So having understood that the object of this is self, he negates the self. So the way to understand this is over the page on page 10. So you jump down the first section and then it repeats that line. He understood that the object of this is self. The yogi negates the self. This next paragraph under there is what explains what's being said. Self in the first line means the nominally existent person, the so-called mere I. This self is a phenomena that exists conventionally. It is the object of observation of the false view of the transitory collection. Okay, so what's being said here is that you're looking at the self that does exist. That's what you're looking at. But then you're projecting onto that something that's not true at all. Okay, so the false view of a transitory collection errs in conceiving this mere I to be an inherently existent I or an inherently existent person. This inherently existent person is the self in the second line of the above quotation. It does not exist either ultimately or conventionally. 
and it is the object to be negated when the yogi meditates on emptiness of a person. The emptiness of a person is a person's lack of inherent existence. So you could just reread that paragraph again and again and again, and it would make more sense every time. That's the main pith here. And the reason why I'm emphasizing it is that when we talk about the object of negation, it seems just in the conversations that we've had that you immediately think it's negating the conventional self. Yeah, there's a difference between the inherently existent self and the conventionally existent self. Yeah, Sigley? Ah, thank you. Uh, is the conventionally existing self that is the one that imputed by the mind upon on the basis of the five aggregates? That's what you mean? Yes. Okay. 100%. Perfect. Yep. So the mere eye, that which is merely labeled on the collection of body and mind, or merely labeled on the aggregates, that is the conventionally existent self, which does exist conventionally, no problem. We look at that, we, we, we view that in a way, and then we project inherence on it and create a whole other pretender that has never existed at all. And so when we're looking for the object of negation, as we've talked about many times, you know, you remember times that you've been criticized or times that you've been praised and that eye arises very strongly and seems to be very obvious. And then you confront it and you say, where are you? And then you find the non-finding, right? We've talked about this many times, but what's important to unpack with this is to say, of this object of negation, let's just let's sit with a little bit more of, why is it that some features and characteristics I say are me, and some of them I say they are learned? Yeah, there are some things about you that you're very happy to say are dependently arisen, that you're very happy to acknowledge the history and the context of. Why is it that then other things you hold on to as anchors of self? What, what, are the, what is the criteria or the conditions that make you say, yes, but this is me? That isn't, but this is. And I think this is a lot of the work that you guys explore with your patients, I'm not sure, but it's a little bit like if there is some aspect in the sea of the dependently, exist, the dependently arisen characteristics that you are labeled on, there's some aspect that is either neglected or overly celebrated, that becomes a prominent defining feature. Right? If that wasn't the case, it would sort of fade to the background and just be one in a sea of characteristics you're labeled upon. But uh, Yonten, uh, conventionally, conventionally, the sense of continuum or your the things you remember, many things are giving you the feeling of being a self. But if you know that this self is not inherently exist, but is interconnectedness or interdependent with other million stuff, would this be uh, not being ignorant? What kind of ignorance? <laughs> no, ignorance by understanding uh, reality. If you do have a sense of continuum, conventionally, but if you keeping the understanding that these feelings or continuum or whatever, his personal history, etc., etc., is not inherently exists, but it's interdependent with other million things within and, with, and without, would it be considered as not ignorant? Yeah, it would be, it would be, yeah, it's like you're moving towards the conceptual understanding of emptiness. Yeah. So it's not perceptual, it's not cutting the root of samsara, but it's breaking the everyday pattern of why we get reactive. No, we know why we get reactive, but we do know that it's not, things are not inherently exist whatsoever. And we're looking for the, the uh, facts and the circumstances that are interconnected. As far as we can discover, would it be considered as knowing emptiness? Um, it, would be, it would be knowing dependent arising conceptually. Yeah. So, I mean, so dependent arising and emptiness live in the same place at the same time. 
But to understand the way in which things are dependent, you have to then come to the conclusion that they are empty. So it's like, it's a step removed, but it's completely 100% the right direction. And we, we go that direction and you've gone that direction probably even before you met Buddhism, looking at the history and context of something is something that we do all the time as people interested in psychology and interested in why people do what they do and why do we hurt ourselves needlessly. And you know, this is an inner conversation of our whole life, I'm guessing, whether or not you met Buddhism or not. Everyone exists as a result of their context, conditioning, etc. Then you look at nature nurture questions and you wonder what is the self? And yet when we're in our daily life, there is a lot of conversation about that's just not me. That's just not who I am. I just need this. I just can't have that. What is the authentic self? You know, there is a lot of that in our everyday conversation, even our inner conversation, despite knowing better. So despite knowing better, those elements that have been celebrated or neglected become prominent features of identity. So when we're looking at the prominent features of our identity, to just say, oh, they dependently arise, it doesn't work for us. We have to actually look at the way in which they dependently arise so that it allows to, in a way, dissolve into emptiness. It was already empty, but by examining it using dependent and arising analysis, it enables it to dissolve back into its correct perspective. So, you know, you take the whole sea of your features, you know, imagine the sea of your features, you know, the ones that you identify with, the ones that you never think about, then it's like you took a highlighter pen and just highlighted a couple of them and said, these are me, more than all of these other things. So then you have to ask yourself, why do I think those are more me than other things? And this, you know, I think this is the work that a lot of you do, but to, to sit with where does the object of negation kind of come forward and start to dominate? And why this? So I was trying to think of examples that weren't the ones we always talk about. I was thinking about how, um, maybe I've told you this story, but once I was on an airplane, and I was sleeping and the flight attendant came to wake me up for food. So I was sleeping like this and the flight attendant leaned over me and she said, sir, <laughs> sir, <laughs> sir. And so I heard her saying sir, but I assumed she wasn't talking to me because I am a lady. And so I didn't open my eyes. And then eventually I opened my eyes because she wouldn't stop saying sir. And as soon as I opened my eyes, she said, oh, I'm sorry, ma'am. I'm sorry, ma'am. So for some reason, eyes closed, sir, eyes open, ma'am. Right? I, you know, I was like, this is very interesting. So it was almost like the object of negation roared to the front of my eyeballs and said, I am a lady. <laughs> How dare you mislabel me, right? It's like that, that object of negation, that pivot point of identity roared forward. And I just wonder if I hadn't been offended or annoyed or amused if, it just, if I just opened my eyes, if she would have switched, if she would have kept calling me sir, you know, if that identity hadn't started kind of shouting itself through my eyes to her. Do you know what I mean? Um, I was thinking of another time when I first came here my neighbor came up to me and she said, oh, welcome to Israel. This is your first time, blah, blah, blah. Um, what is your family background? And somehow I knew she was not asking about my ancestors. I knew that she was asking about my family of origins religion. I knew she was asking if I was Jewish or not, right? And I said, oh, yeah, my family is Christian. And she went, and I said, they're Christian, but they're, they're relaxed about it. I felt the need to immediately. They were relaxed about it. And she said, oh, oh, we're Muslim, but we're relaxed about it. And then we were fine. And, you know, I thought, isn't that interesting that, you know, I haven't been Christian since I was 12 years old, you know. I, my family is like the most progressive, reformed, relaxed Christians ever. Um, and yet still, that immediately was an identity feature, even though that's not my identity because I could feel her calling that out of me. Do you know what I mean? So it's like sometimes 
it's from our side and sometimes it's from their side, but of course, if there wasn't something on both sides, these eruptions of identity wouldn't happen. And together with these eruptions of identity is othering, right? Is a dualism that says, I am other than what you've labeled and that other makes me want what protects it and feeds it and wants away from it what doesn't. So as soon as there's that moment of dualism, there is opportunity for conflict and opportunity for suffering and negative states of mind. So always with that dualism is the problem. And so then if we're unpacking our identity and we're asking ourselves, what are those little points that have highlighted and said, those are inherent me, those are definitely me. The rest of the me is just kind of nominally me, learned me, whatever, coming and going me. All those points I've highlighted are actually points where now I get to have conflict inner conflict, outer conflict, conflict extravaganza. So why those points? Why were those points highlighted by me? You know, rather than just getting them to arise by thinking of when you were criticized or praised, which is what we normally do in the meditation, looking for the object of negation, to sit further back with what are those points I've highlighted? You know, so you can just really sit. The last time you were triggered by someone in some way, either you were having a rush of delight and a feeling of being seen and understood, or you were having a rush of er aggravation and irritation and annoyance, but there was a rush of I, why? What had you highlighted? And rather than saying, oh, I shouldn't highlight that, you bring it into the forefront and say, is there any context or condition where that's not even true? Is there any context or condition that made that come about other than this core me I'm so identified with? And then eventually you realize there was no core. It just happened here. So I can label it here, but it's not coming from here. Is it making sense? Ish? So, so this object of negation, we go too far and we negate the conventional self. This is what often happens. And that's what I'm trying to help us avoid. Yeah. Yeah, Ranon or yours? Yeah, yours? I would like to say that the fifth principle of quantum physics uh, speaks about the abolishing of the principle of identity. Things are existing but identity is only something that we are labeling on them. And physically, we can do all kinds of uh, experiments, uh, procedures, to see that even electrons or even smaller particles, subparticles, behave as if they are a, what we call contingent existence. They don't have names. We are on, only uh, coloring them with names and we color ourselves in, in the name of a female or male, sir, or men, and so on. But it, it's, a, it's a really physical, uh, subatomic uh, dimension uh, characteristic, the non-identification, the non-identity. And in psychology, we, we are so concentrated in the conventional where we want to strengthen the identity, the sense of me, the sense of I. And that's something that we have to take into consideration that strengthening the sense of I wouldn't strengthen the wrong conception about the inherent I. Yeah, it's exactly. Not, it's not a contradiction. It's a way of trying to embrace the two dimension of reality, the conventional and the ultimate. Exactly. It's a, it's a conversation that comes up a lot when I'm talking to people that are what are called engaged Buddhists or people that are um, social or environmental activists and also Buddhists who um, are very much engaged in politics and transformation of outer types while still holding Buddhist ideals. Is that the conversation we have a lot is that if someone tells you that you are not something that you think that you are, that not becomes a bigger deal. 
or you're not allowed to be, or you're bad to be, you know? So then that becomes the point of prominence, like for example, race. Would we even notice race or the color of each other's skin if it wasn't um, negated by something, if it wasn't um, seen as something agreeable or disagreeable? Would we even notice, you know, like all the other millions of characteristics of someone's face, you know, um, if suddenly we decided, you know, did the blue eye, brown eye experiment and decided people this or that were more this or that, suddenly it becomes important where before we didn't even notice. Yeah, I just want to, see, to think, to share thinking about in psychology, may, we, we can get to the conventional eye through accumulation, through seeing, through, uh, and in Buddhism, I think, I don't know, we can get to the real eye through negation. It's, the, it's, it's, it's a bit of a, an opposite. Um, yeah, yeah. No, it's a bit like that. And it is a bit like how you need to have such a healthy sense of self and such a secure sense of self before you can meditate on the emptiness of the self. You know, the, if you jump the step of knowing who and what you label yourself as and, you know, kind of what your defining characteristics seem to be, then to negate the self becomes a process of, of annihilation and you freak out and go off the deep end. Um, but it's almost like you pull these features into focus and then say, and no. So I am this and not in any way. And then I am also this and not at all. But you can't skip this, the step of saying, but I seem to be this. I'm thinking about a concept in psychoanalysis. It's called negation. Mm -hmm. It's a concept that Freud introduced, the idea that if somebody says, I am not angry, that means that they are angry. Or I am not stingy, means that they are stingy. And it actually is very similar, I think, to what we are saying here, that the person is introducing themselves in one way, where in fact, like your example at the airplane, he is another way. And Sigmund Freud thought about this. <laughs> I'm not sure that it's exactly the same, but it, but it rings the same connotation that you describe yourself in one way and you are definitely the opposite, actually. Yeah, um, Simona and then Yael. I just uh, wanted to, to, to share that it becomes especially um, challenging uh, when uh, I try to meditate on this and I arrive to the question of uh, who is meditating or who is the negator of the, of, of the self, who is, who is there? I mean, who is the practitioner? Who is, even at that level, it, it becomes spinning. Yeah, it does, <laughs> exactly. But that's probably a good sign if it's getting that far. <laughs> yeah, who is meditating? Yeah, Yael, you had something? I wanted to say uh, something about what Gabi said, that I think it's the word negation, but uh, the meaning is totally different. Uh, because uh, we, I think we're not talking about a characteristic, a specific characteristic of the personality of the person who introduces himself in one way, but he's another way. It, it's something about the the um, the essence of being something or something else. It doesn't matter what the something is. Uh, stingy or not stingy, uh, happy or not happy, it, it's, it doesn't matter. But when you say that um, you first have to say, I'm this and I'm not this, then what is I'm this mean? What is the first, because in, in theoretically, I almost understand better the, the second part of the of the phrase not experientially of course but theoretically i almost understand better the second part of the phrase i'm not this but what does it mean buddhistically that i am this i am I'm not sure if I'm, I'm, I'm clear about 
what I mean to ask, but yeah, I mean, you understand me. <laughs> I, I hope so, and ask again if I don't answer, but it's like, uh, it's like I am merely labeled this, which means I'm not this. So it's like I am a woman merely labeled on anatomical, anatomical features or chromosomes or mentality or whatever I decide is femaleness to me, but I only exist in contrast to that which is merely labeled male. And of course, gender exists on a spectrum and what is the essential defining characteristic is unfindable. You know, you could say defining characteristic of being a woman is having a womb. Well, what if you've had a hysterectomy? You know, are you not a woman? You know, et cetera, et cetera, right? So you kind of bring into focus the sense of, I am this, merely labeled this, not this. Because it is merely labeled, it has not got an essential essence. But it has to be merely labeled in order to see that it has no essential essence. Otherwise we go into nihilism. So it's, it's like, you know, there's one way of expressing it which sometimes really helps, which is that everything has a nature, but it doesn't exist by that nature or from that nature. So to say, you know, the nature of light is to illuminate darkness, you could say that, no problem. But, to, but then to say that it exists by that nature, you'd have to say, well, no, because there has to be darkness as a referent, et cetera, et cetera. You know, so it's, it's, it is this delicate thing of making sure that we're always labeling emptiness together with the conventionality. It has to conventionally exist in order for it to ultimately exist. Otherwise, it doesn't exist at all, like a sky flower or the horns of a rabbit. You know, like this, you know, which are the traditional examples. So, so these, like, these points of being highlighted, you know, this is very interesting for us because we, we are so good at processing and so good at looking at context and history that it's hard for us sometimes to remember those points that we've given excessive emphasis to we say, oh, that doesn't matter because I know better, when it does still matter, you know? And in, in, in order for us to move through and beyond and into an awareness of emptiness of it, we have to notice those points of friction, those points of excessive identification in order to let go of identification. So, you know, you identify as anything, you're sitting there, so take Simona's example, like who is meditating? What is meditating? I obviously am the meditator. That's the I, I found it, it's the meditator. Hooray, I'm nothing else, only the meditator. And then you say, what is meditating? And then you remember minds and mental factors. And you remember that there is the mind, primary consciousness, and in its retinue is the mental factor of intention, moving towards the focal object. There's the mental factor of attention, or mental engagement, holding yourself on the meditation object. There's, you know, the object ascertaining mental factor, which is, um, you know, having mindfulness of it. There's all these different things happening and all of them are dependent on one another and a number of other things. And so then you realize that the meditator has no core essence and yet there is meditation happening. Are you with me? So there is meditation happening. There is the experience of meditation, but it's merely labeled on a collection of mental events. And to be, if it was inherently existent, it would just sort of be there naturally as one solid thing unrelated to what came before or after or together with. And we know that isn't the case. In order to meditate, you have to decide to meditate, be able to meditate and sit down and do it. All of which had a million different causations. You know, and then once you're there, you think, what is meditating? I am meditating the body. No, the body's not meditating. The mind is the mind one thing, unrelated to anything. And then you see why we study minds and mental factors, because you realize that the mind has a play of interaction. Yeah, and the interaction within the mind, no one piece of the mental factors are 100% in charge. You know, you can start to, what winds up happening once you do a bit of minds and mental factors, you sit there, who is meditating? You think, 
Well, obviously, mental intention is the I, because that's the one moving towards, and that's it, that's it. And then you think, oh, wait, but for it to do that, it needed discrimination to be able to label and decide. And then it also needed something to focus on. And then it also needed this. Oh, intention is not the I. And yet intention exists interdependently. So, so you kind of like allow it to rise into the forefront and say, that's it. Ah, oh, not at all. <laughs> yeah. Oh, unmute, unmute. Unmute, yeah. There we go. Um, oh. <laughs> oh, hold on, let's just do Simona first. She was muted. Oh, right. okay, sorry. Yeah, start again, yeah. I just wanted to say that you said all this and I began to sweat because it was so much. It was like, you know, <laughs> like running in a marathon today outside. <laughs> you can do it slowly. <laughs> you can do it slowly, sorry. No panic attacks. <laughs> oh, Neta, sorry, go on. I'm thinking if uh, part of the uh, negation can be uh, uh, realizing I am not just this. Not I'm not this, but I'm not just this. And then it touches the infinity of the, the self and, the, and that's the ultimate because I can't be um, I can't grasp or I can't experience everything. So saying it's not just me every moment, would it be? Can it's going it... in the right direction. Yeah, it is. It's going in the right direction. To say it's not just me is still implying there's a little hub, you know, or there's a little core that is gathering experiences to it or to sending things out from it, that there's a little core there. So to say not just me is going in the right direction, but then you have to look for the just, you know, and sort of dissolve the just into emptiness. So there's a lot of, um, in Tantra, there's a lot of discussion of dissolve everything into emptiness and then from emptiness, blah, blah, blah arises. This arises, this syllable, this image, this, 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 that. What you're basically saying is, I've decided to make this to do this function, but it doesn't do it in and of itself. It's just because a collection of factors made me decide it. And I'm riding the wave of previous effort and thought of this direction, color and shape. So it's more efficient, but it's not self-existent. You know, so there's this kind of like, if you dissolve everything into emptiness, what's really being said is you're remembering dependent arising for a while. I'm not just this, I'm not just that. You know, and I am this because of, I'm this because of. But then the I you're realizing is not at the center of it and is not holding it. It's just merely labeled on it and no more than that. So you can draw a circle around a set of experiences or a set of characteristics and say, I will call it this. But to think that this is what gave you permission to label it there is the mistake. Because you could, you know, circle any collection of any things and brand it as something. And yet a valid basis relies on worldly convention. So it's, you know, it's very delicate. Yeah, Edna. From the time of this process being done repeatedly and it is a very demanding one uh, until you get to perceive directly. Um, it's, it's a huge, huge uh, effort and uh, discipline uh, and the, the the beginning of it, as much as I understand, is, is very, very cognitive. I need to very like conceptualize it and think and rethink and rethink. It's, it, it's, it's so far from the experience. How could it get to be more experiential and thus, you know, grounded? 
Yeah, I mean, it's, it's getting very cognitive and intellectual because that's where my head is at right now. And I'm looking at Chandakurti and that, not, that just clicks me right into that space. And it's all Chandakurti's fault. Just joking. Um, experientially, I'm guessing, you know, it's been a long time since I've been in therapy, but just in like good conversations with friends. You know, when you're trying to find like a nugget of why do I do that? or why do I keep doing that or whatever it is that you're doing that you know is dysfunctional, but you do it anyway. So you're having some sort of process with someone and you're talking it over and you finally hit it. And you're like, oh, that's what I was thinking. That's what's behind it. That's why I do that. And now I don't have to. And you still might just because of the force of habit, but it's lost some of its um, power and you're much more likely to catch yourself the next time it's about to happen. So it's like when you've found the nugget, you know, the sweat children and I call it the nugget, right? We found the, like, the main thing that is, oh, that's why I do that, and that's why I think it's useful, and here's why it's not, and here's where it came from. And you have that release, you know, that release feeling of, all oh, right, yep. <sighs> right. You know that one? Yeah, oh, yeah, that's why I do that that and it's like in it feels like when we're talking like you have to then do that for every single thing you've ever identified yourself as and ever done and you don't it's that if you really did it very very well with the self then anything you turn your attention to that truth would be revealed you know if it is true in this case it is true in all these other cases and that's why we look at looking at the selflessness of persons first because then when you look at the selflessness of phenomena, it comes naturally. Yeah, so it's not like you have to then go through every single thing of, you know, this is only merely labeled a mirror because, this is only merely labeled a nose because, I am only an angry person or a happy person or a whatever person because you don't have to go through all of that with every single infinite detail of your branding if you did it well with the self itself and had that aha moment of, not in any way from its own side, and yet merely labeled, you know? So when we're doing this process of looking for the object of negation, you're not overemphasizing any key piece of identity that you've chosen as your project that session or that day. You're just using it to anchor yourself into experience. You know, one day you might be very identified with your gender, and then for months at a time, you might not even remember your gender. It might not even come up into your consciousness, right? For months at a time, you might not remember that your parents are Jewish or your parents are Christian, but then suddenly one day it's a very important thing. You know, so you know that it doesn't matter in the grand scheme of things, but whatever today feels like you, that can be your object of analysis, while at the same time remembering it's symptomatic of every other way you think. Yeah, so you think, okay, so today I'm gonna to look at, I don't know, conceptions of thin and fat, <laughs> of beautiful or not beautiful. Today I'm gonna to think of conceptions of poor or wealthy. Today I'm gonna, whatever, like feels like you're, you know, today I feel like this, I am this thing. That becomes the pivot point. And in the back of your mind, you remember that that is true of everything else but it gives you an experiential taste to the whole process. You know, so you sit down, I'm looking for the object of negation. Today, what bothered me? Today, what triggered me? Or today, what did I get excited about in an attachment way that made me lose myself and lose my focus? And I got into some attachment spiral of, spiral of like hunger and craving. I'm on a roll, we'll stop. Read more Chandra Kurdi. see you Wednesday. <laughs> Take a minute and just let it all connect. <laughs>